Uh, I'm not going to lie. We're about to go to some very dark places together in the next 30 minutes. Before we do that, and I go all black mirror on you, it's about four things I want to get straight. The first, I'm afraid, is that I'm not going to tell you whether the machines are coming for you. There are lots of people who talk about that at length, and I'm no expert, and I wouldn't make a fool of myself in front of 500 such brilliant people. The second is that I passionately believe in the positive power of advertising. It's built some of the greatest businesses of our time. It finds economic solutions where currency can't. And it's the massive potential for personal growth, for business growth, and for new economic models. I also believe passionately in the power of machine learning, data science, AI, if you want to use that word. I think it has applications for humankind across pretty much every area in which we, our economies are developing. Healthcare, transportation, and yes, advertising. Because before I start, I believe that when AI and machine learning, artificial intelligence collide, we create new possibility. At Essence, our mission has always been to make advertising more valuable to the world. And when we started the company in 2005, that was about optimizing placements and creatives to find, hopefully, new veins of performance for our clients. But today, we're able to do that at a grain that we never knew would be possible, at the level of the occurrence, to think about levels of personalization that human beings can't even store in their head. And for me, that's exciting because I think it allows us to balance the three-legged stool, if you like, the three-legged stool of the advertiser, the publisher, and the audience to find a new economic solution to a problem that is honestly failing right now. We see audiences that are rejecting advertising, we see publishers going out of business, and we see brands not getting enough return. So I'm incredibly excited. I am long on machine learning and AI, and I want to give you a few examples of why I'm so excited. This first one is a, a piece of work we did uh, with a, a subscription-based streaming content client. You sign up, you pay a monthly fee, and you get access uh, to a, a whole library of, of um, live and existing footage. Um, these are difficult customers to acquire. It's a premium product. CPAs are not, are not low. And uh, so we invested in a, a technique called uplift modeling. Uplift modeling isn't particularly new. But what it, what's exciting in the machine learning era is that we are able to screen thousands of candidate signals to find the ones that are particularly predictive in any particular instance so that we can build a model for the likelihood of every single person in our audience converting. And not only converting, but converting with and without exposure to advertising. So I think earlier in the day there was a conversation about incrementality. This is the incrementality plot for 11 million unique individuals. On the horizontal axis, the likelihood of them converting without exposure to advertising, and on the vertical axis, the likelihood of them converting as a result of an ad. And through that, a 45-degree line. Everyone below that 45-degree line is less likely to convert if we show them an ad. 22% of the population lives down there. The worst you can do is show them advertising. Just by removing that, we've reduced, re reduced wastage, reduced ad annoyance, increased total sales, and improved ROI. Meanwhile, above the line, all the people who are positively susceptible to advertising obviously are distributed unevenly. There are lots of people clustered down here, slightly less responsive, but of course there are far more of them. Suddenly, thanks to this machine learning work, we can understand what decreasing marginal returns really mean. And using all of this, plotting where populations sit across the two, we get a 214% improvement in performance by suppressing the audiences we shouldn't and focusing on the persuadable ones. Second, um, this is a, uh, an entertainment company. An entertainment company's craft is to persuade the right swing audiences. There are lots of people who will buy your content no matter what, no matter how good it is. There are lots of people who will never buy it, no matter how good it is. And between those is a swing audience. They are the people that you need to focus your marketing dollars on. So prediction in entertainment is the name of the game. And the way this is traditionally done is you field some research, you ask some panels in a few markets where you can afford it, and then a bunch of experienced executives review that data and try and weigh where they should place their next bet. 
market by market, audience by audience. And sometimes they're right, just over half the time. Usually, or very often, they're, they're just over or just under. We took a new way of doing this. We screened 2,000 signals from popular culture, from competitor spend. We looked at social media. Uh, and we built a new model that predicts uh, the, the, the total sales for each title seven times out of 10 more accurately than human beings. And when we get it wrong, the average error is about a third lower. This means we can forecast into more markets more quickly, more accurately, and make marketing budgets work that much better. One more example, it wouldn't be an ad exchange at conference if we didn't talk about bidding. Um, this is an example for, uh, actually for our client, Google. Um, we work on their uh, Google store, where we work on hardware sales, and we tested uh, different bidding strategies. Uh, we tested one where we used algorithmic optimizers off the shelf, and one where we tested a machine learning model that we built. And sure enough, we found that the two are roughly equivalent in performance for the first week during the training period, but by week two, we'd opened up a 40% gap in, in um, revenue per impression. And we'd done that by training the model using behavioral signals, looking at how people browse the store to identify patterns of behavior that are correlated with high value purchases and focusing our bids in those areas. These are three hopefully somewhat impressive examples. I'm really proud of them, but they are very discrete use cases. They're very discrete applications of machine learning, and they feel very applicable in the present. But the thing I'm getting the most excited about in the world of AI is that it's opening the new door to a new kind of serendipity. We're seeing testimonials like this. Ads for this client are doing particularly well in this context we never expected. This audience that we didn't see coming find the product really interesting. And this is possible because machines can sift through so many different correlations and find patterns that human beings miss. So people worry that machine learning and AI are removing the surprises from marketing and making it dry and sterile. Far from it. This is the new serendipity. But the trouble with serendipity is that it's unpredictable. I could go on like this all afternoon. And in fact, these three still quite hard-hitting examples are, are three of the safest that I came up with in a bit of a brainstorm on a particularly rainy afternoon in London. Some of you in the room, hopefully all of you, are already thinking about the blacklist and the whitelist that you could draw up to stop this from happening to your brand. I don't believe rules are ever going to beat this problem because there are too many unforeseen combinations, too many pieces of user-generated content that could arise. Even the most innocuous platforms, brands, and content can be put together to create horrible, ugly realities that we didn't see coming. So hopefully I've got your attention. Hopefully. I've convinced you this is an important problem. I want to spend a few moments thinking about why it's a hard problem. Consciously or not, human beings filter the world. We are inundated with input signals every day, and it would be impossible for us to process them all knowing that we are. Through our memories, our values, our beliefs, language, orientation to space and time and energy, we delete a lot of it, we distort a great deal of it, and we create generalizations about the world. They are, if you like, our map of reality, our consciousness, maybe. They're what makes us human, perhaps. And there are lots of organizations out there that have created fantastic established guardrails for advertising. The ANA in this country, the Advertising Standards Authority in the, in the UK, and these standards help protect us from things that are harmful, that are misleading, um, that are unfair, dishonest, offensive. And those guardrails work pretty well most of the time. But they rely on that set of subjective filters that I referenced. They rely on human beings to interpret them. 
to put them into practice in a manner that is actually applicable in advertising. And unfortunately, subjective filters are really, really difficult for machines to figure out. There are three key reasons I can see as to why this problem is so tough. The first is figuring out what good looks like, or if you like, defining what our social utility is. So this is a problem that's as old as, as political theory. Um, Plato used to talk a while back about, um, I say that as if I knew him in the pub or something. Plato used to talk about happiness of society as the goal. Um, and in the end, people like um, J.S. Mill and, and Rawls evolved that theory uh, to talk about utility. Um, and they ask questions like, how well off is a society? Is it as well off as its happiest member, its least happy member, the average of its happiness across society, the standard deviation of the happiness? And there are all sorts of ways of thinking about this. It's really difficult. And we model through. In society, we have supreme courts that make decisions. We have politics. We have democracy. And it's messy. And we figure it out. And in fact, as a, as a, as a race, we've been incredibly bad at writing it down. But the problem is you kind of have to write it down, put it in code, if you want a machine to apply. And this leads to really difficult questions like, should the self-driving car mow down the elderly couple to save the life of a young child? Surgeons make decisions like this every day. They have to decide which patients to save. They have to decide how to prioritize transplants using the likelihood of success and the value of a life. And in fact, insurance companies make these comparisons. But they're really uncomfortable. And when they get out into the public domain, people freak out. This is life and death, and advertising isn't life and death, although it feels like it to some of us sometimes. But there are corollaries in advertising is it worth offending a few hundred people to sell a few hundred thousand penis pumps? Brands will say they have a zero risk tolerance, but they don't because if they had a zero risk tolerance, they wouldn't be advertising. I've always wanted to say that on a stage, by the way. <laughs> and in fact, risk tolerance is one of the really important parts of this, but we have to define our social utility to understand it. There's a really good paper about risk tolerance in cloud computing uh, that's written by the team at Google and been, been open sourced um, that puts some of these issues into perspective. The last point on social utility that I think it's important for us to think about is protecting the weak. Anyone but the most extreme free market theorists would say it's important that we have some system to look after people who don't naturally succeed in a complete free economic system. And we're already seeing these issues arise with algorithms. So there was a paper link from, from LinkedIn uh, last week, which, which Zach Rogers was kind enough to share with me, which uh, disclosed the fact that LinkedIn's hiring algorithms had been discriminating against women. And so they'd stopped using them. And meanwhile, the ACLU um, have a whole team focused on algorithmic fairness. Um, and they're really concerned about racial justice in algorithms. This is a real and present challenge. The second one I want to talk about is imperfect information. For markets to find good solutions, and I've spoken to this about at, at other events from Ad Exchanger before, you need good information. In fact, if you have perfect information, a perfect algorithm, in theory, you could make the world a perfect place. Machines could make all the decisions for us, and we could just lie back and consume. Nirvana, or hell, maybe, I don't know. But the world isn't perfect, and we don't have perfect information. Nobody does. And the truth is, human beings are really good at dealing with information gaps. We're really good at figuring out what we don't know and adjusting for it, guessing what it might look like. And machines have a much more difficult time. Generally, they have to, know, they have to work with what they can understand. So as human beings, we know that when people buy a case of wine, it might be for a graduation, graduation party, or it might be because someone's died and we're having a wake. Someone's going into a, a building with two stories. They might be going into the nail bar or the funeral parlor. And if someone's buying a cell phone, they might be buying a cell phone because they like a new phone, because they broke their old one, or because they're being stalked and they desperately need to get away from a disturbing situation. We can project into all those situations and make sure that we don't do things that are offensive. 
Now, machines can do a lot of that through trial and error, but you can't arrive at everything through trial and error. I was at an event a couple of weeks ago with a product manager from a tech company that builds um, ad tech, and they were trying to persuade me that it was okay that their platform had no language controls because the algorithms would figure out which creative was the most effective in a given market, and eventually that one would rise to the top. And the learning period was only a week long, so it didn't matter. I was struggling to explain that most brands care about looking stupid in front of their audiences by serving up Polish ads to Turkish people. The other element of imperfect information is really important to consider here is time horizons. Human beings aren't great at thinking long term. I bet every one of you's had a hangover once or twice, and I bet every one of you's chosen the burger when you should have had the salad. But machines are considerably worse. Not because they're not capable of it, but because they generally don't have the information to make long term decisions. And this is how we've ended up with good websites turning into clickbait farms. Because on the surface of it, in the short run, looks like a good decision. Revenue maximization today. Never mind the fact that you're destroying your website for tomorrow. It's how our industry has started to retarget itself into oblivion. Great, more sales today. Never mind that I'm pissing off all my best customers. This isn't a failing of AI, but it is a failing of bad information, and there's a failing of the bad use of AI. The third thought, and the last one really here that I want to share, is about the new nature of responsibility in an algorithmic advertising world. Disclosure and accountability are absolutely core to all those um, kind of pillars that I spoke about from governing bodies that give us guardrails for advertising. But in 2016 and 17, where we had the peak of the crisis of brand safety and and um, election manipulation, and all the bad stuff that was going on. Everyone was pointing fingers at everybody else. The newspapers were pointing fingers at Google and Facebook because they wanted them to be shown up in a bad light. The other newspapers were pointing fingers at the advertisers who were cruelly abusing their audiences. The advertisers were pointing fingers at the platforms. The platforms were saying the advertisers hadn't used the platforms properly. Who knows? There's probably some fault in everyone. But the blame game doesn't work when ultimately we have to decide whose responsibility it is to protect the weak-willed from the sect recruiters, the alcoholics from, from the booze ads, the gullible from the con artists. And this isn't well defined at all. The other element of responsibility that I think is very challenging is the question of social cohesion. Traditionally, media of all forms and advertising with it has been a mechanism for social cohesion. It brought people together. We talked about great ads. We enjoyed things together. We even laughed at the bad ones. But when every ad is different, when every experience has been personalized, could ads become a vehicle for social fragmentation, for division? Is that so far-fetched, coming from someone whose country is about to leave the European Union, potentially? on the back of very manipulative social media advertising? How should brands think about that? How should brands think about meaning of brand in a world where everyone's experience of a brand is different? Nike made a very brave choice when they chose Colin Kaepernick as their brand ambassador. But imagine they let an algorithm decide which brand ambassador every single member of their audience should have. Could you imagine advertising generated around the personal biases of every individual consumer? So I think this collision of AI and advertising is one of the most complex problems that our industry has ever faced, probably the single most complex problem. I think the issues that we've been dealing with in the last decade, while well, they've given me plenty of headaches and sleepless nights, pale in comparison. But I do all want, also want to reiterate, I believe this is the future. And I believe this is the answer. We have to rise ourselves to the challenge. I think advertising is going to be perhaps 
the first industry to collide with these issues. We're not going to be the only one. This is going to happen across every sector. But advertising will be one of the first to confront it because our craft is so ephemeral. We're not building cars or space rockets. We're building pictures and words. I think the time to talk about this is now. It might seem far-fetched. I know it's really hard still to automate a lot of these basic things. It's still hard. You're wrestling with APIs and data platforms, and we're all integrating these things day to day, and it always feels more difficult than it should be. But you can't put this off. The time to talk about this is now. AI is just like us, but faster. You know, throughout history, go back to the Industrial Revolution, technology has the same effect of concentrating wealth and power, and AI accelerates that same effect. So we have to have this conversation now before we've reached escape velocity. And you just have to look at the speed of learning in the last two years. The time is now. So I told you I was going to take you to a dark place. I did. Um, but I don't think we're doomed. Far from it. First of all, I think that the companies that are dominating the agenda about this, this technology are the most long-term, the most optimistic, and the most responsible companies that history has ever seen. There was an absolutely brilliant paper published by Sundar Pichai of Google summarizing their tenets of their AI philosophy. And I promise I wrote this presentation before I saw it because it basically follows the same pattern, talking about how they will protect against these forces Google and Amazon and Facebook and their counterparts in other countries think very, very long term. No one has a bigger interest in protecting the future than they do because they know these technologies are key to their sustained success. Perhaps more importantly, I think this is the solution to the advertising crisis. Despite the fact it's hard, despite the fact that it comes with lots of challenges, this is how we solve the problem of advertising that cannot find an economic solution to that three-legged equation that I spoke about. We can create advertising that is more respectful, more additive, more effective, more beautiful, and more profitable. This is actually redemption for advertising, if we lean in and make it work. So I have a few asks of you all things that you can do, and I will do, to make it work. Please don't ignore this presentation. Um, I hope I got your attention today. Um, please carry it on. Carry the conversation on. I don't, I'm no expert in this field. I know a lot about advertising. I know a lot about data science. I know a little bit about AI. Um, and I talk to a lot of people to put this story together. Um, you can do that just as easily as I can. So please think about it. Talk about it. Ask about it. Talk to your colleagues and train them. You're the experts. This room represents the leadership of this industry. Talk about it. Possibly more practically, just think about the degrees of freedom that you are prepared to give machine learning tools. They are essential, and we are deploying them throughout our business and across all of our clients. But just think about each degree of freedom. Does it need that degree of freedom? Does it have enough information to make a good choice in this situation? And finally, but most importantly, ask hard questions. You are the buyers. This is the buy side. Money talks in this business. And you know that brilliant paper written by Sundar was a reaction to pressure that was placed on Google. And you should place that kind of pressure on all of your vendors Make sure you hold them to account, because they have a history of doing what their customers want, and that is you. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>